If you will be turning in your Bibles to Acts chapter 18, we'll not go there right away, but we'll come to that passage here in just a few minutes. I look out this morning and I, I see some spots where people normally are. <laughs> and of course, we understand where they are. I got here the first thing. Normally, we get here at about, oh, roughly about 930. And without fail, uh, Brother Joe's always here. Uh, before us and when I got here and I saw Neil instead of Joe I said something's wrong uh, I said not not that I wasn't glad to see Neil don't get me wrong but uh, I just knew Joe wasn't in his place but uh, of course our prayers are with the Mitchell family and Danielle hope she feels better and all those long list of people that we mentioned uh, being sick right now this is still very real it's not something that we ought to panic or worry uh, you know to a sinful extent about but it's something that we do need to be aware of and and uh, of course Think about those that are suffering at this point in time, and hopefully, Lord willing, they'll be restored to their health. As far as this morning's lesson is concerned, uh, so we have been studying through the book of Matthew. I know we've taken a break from the book of Matthew for a few weeks now, and I'm still not ready necessarily to go back to the textual study. But I was thinking about that part where we left off at. Uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, we had left off at the beginning of Matthew chapter 7, uh, where it talks about the topic of judgment. And we know that the Scriptures don't teach us, as some would claim, that we ought not to ever judge, but rather the Scriptures teach us that we ought to be very careful when it comes to this topic. You know, in that passage, it even talks about righteous, or the fact that righteous judgment, it requires self-examination. As is illustrated in that passage, you have that illustration where you have this man, and this guy has a speck in his eye. And his friend, or his, his brother, is trying to remove that speck from his eye while he's got this big log sticking out of his eye. So the illustration is, of course, we need to make sure that we examine ourselves when it comes to correcting our, our brethren. I'm not ready, like I said, to study that passage in its entirety, but that passage, it got me thinking about the topic of correction that we're going to be looking at this morning. As Christians... It's not uncommon for us to seek to correct those that are in error. You know, the Bible in various places, it warns us to, to stand against false teaching, to expose those that teach falsely. Matthew 18, we're told uh, how to approach a brother that's sinned against us. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul talks about warning those that are not obedient. James chapter 5 talks about bringing back someone who has wandered away from the truth. And while at times this responsibility, I'll admit, sometimes it can be awkward. Sometimes it can be difficult. That certainly, you know, obviously if it wasn't difficult, the Bible wouldn't tell us how to go about it. But my observation is that often it's human nature for us not to hesitate to want to call out all the wrong things and everyone else. But our human nature is that sometimes we struggle with how to react to situations where we're being corrected. So I thought perhaps before we talked about Matthew chapter 7, I thought it might be helpful for us to spend a few minutes this morning thinking about that scenario where we need correction. Because if we think about how we would feel or how we might react when we're, you know, we're being the ones corrected, I think that may help us as we think about helping our brother who needs correction. How will you react when you realize that you are wrong about something? How are you going to handle it if you realize that something that you have practiced, something that you've been taught, or something that you are teaching someone, or, or something even that you've gone to the extent that you're binding it on others, how are you going to react when you find that those things are not correct? First thing I want to do is I want us to consider a few examples in the Scriptures where we find people were corrected about something. So I had you turn to Matthew chapter 18 because that's where our first example is. Uh, that we'll find is this morning. So in, in Acts chapter 18, there at the end of that chapter, we're introduced to uh, the figure of Apollos. We actually talked about Apollos just the other night. Apollos, he is described as a Jew, and he's from Alexandria. Described as someone that was very eloquent, very competent in the Scriptures. Of course, at this point in time, that would have likely been the Old Testament Scriptures. He's described as a teacher. He's one that taught accurately concerning Jesus. With one exception, he only knew the baptism of John the Baptist, or of John the Baptist. In other words, Apollos he was ignorant 
concerning baptism into Christ. Notice in verse 26, it says, And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and they explained to him the way of God more accurately. So even though he was this wonderful teacher, even though he was very eloquent, there was something that he was teaching that was not accurate to the truth. Thus, he was corrected by Priscilla and Aquila. I want you to notice in the text, there's no evidence that he continued to teach what he had always been teaching. Uh, you know, he didn't find himself in the situation where because he was this eloquent, well-known, well-liked teacher, he didn't find himself letting his ego get in the way. It says that he went on from there and he greatly helped those who he came in contact with. I think we can assume he made the necessary correction. Also in Acts chapter 19, you go just a little bit forward past that story in Acts chapter 18. And this is kind of a follow-up story, I would say, to that introduction of Apollos. Apollos had gone on to Corinth, but Paul then arrived in Ephesus. It says that he was talking to some of the disciples and realized that there was some confusion regarding that topic of baptism. They had not yet been baptized, or they had been baptized into John's baptism, but they were not yet aware of baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, which is what had been commanded back in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. So then, of course, uh, you know, Paul you know, gave them the, I guess you could say, updated instructions, or he let them know about this truth of the gospel. They had learned the truth, and notice that they didn't keep on holding on to what they had done in the past. They knew that they had to be baptized according to what the truth was. Otherwise, if they didn't make corrections, they weren't being obedient to God. So, of course, they would make that correction. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. One more, or actually, I've got two more examples, actually. Another example that comes to mind is the story we read about in Galatians chapter 2, where you have Paul, and he's recounting this story to the Galatians about his encounter with Peter the Apostle. Again, Peter was an apostle. We read about Peter a whole lot in the New Testament. He was a very prominent figure in the early church. You know, we see in Acts chapter 10, he was the one specifically that had taken the gospel to the Gentiles. When we see the story of Cornelius, he had led many people to Christ. However, we read about in Galatians chapter 2, now he's a hypocrite. Even though he was very well aware that the Gentiles were equal members in the body of Christ, because of fear of what other people taught, specifically he feared, it says, the circumcision party. He mistreated his Gentile brethren. It says that he would not eat with his Gentile brethren. And not only was he mistreating his Gentile brethren, but because of his influence, it caused Barnabas to fall away. He was leading others astray. Paul saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel as it refers to it in verse 14. And so it says at the beginning of verse 11, it says that Paul opposed him to his face. And then at the end of verse 11, it says that Peter, he stood condemned. Now, while it doesn't tell us here what Peter's reaction was and what he did following this, here we have an example where a very prominent member in the church, they had their conduct corrected. And if I can assume what happens here, likely Peter knew, especially when this happened with Paul, likely Peter knew he knew that he was in the wrong. He had sinned publicly. And not only had he sinned, but he had hurt others in the process. You know, Peter had a couple of options here. He could dismiss Paul's admonitions and he could dismiss the truth of the gospel that Paul had confronted him with. But in so doing, he would continue to hurt himself. And he would continue to hurt others, even influencing others to do wrong. The only option that Peter had was to repent and he ought to make amends with those that he had harmed. One more example I was thinking about is the account that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm not necessarily going to, to read this passage in its entirety, but he starts out in that passage, we're talking about that section, talking about the Lord's Supper, where he starts out telling them, he says, in the following instructions, I do not commend you. So in other words, there was something that they were doing that wasn't right. When they assembled, it says that there were divisions. 
And I'm not sure exactly what had happened here, but either they had made some addition to their assembly or they were making a mockery of the Lord's Supper. Basically, Paul says, he says, whatever it is that you're doing, that's not the Lord's Supper that was commanded. So in other words, the Corinthians, their practice in worship, when they assembled together, it was in error. And thus Paul was not going to commend them in what they were doing. So we see then in verses 23 through 26, Paul gives them the instructions on how Jesus had told them to partake of the Lord's Supper. And then he alludes to the fact that if they took the Lord's Supper without the proper regard for what it stood for, without the proper attitudes, it wasn't going to be pleasing. Again, I can only assume what happens here because we just we have you know his instructions to them in this letter. Because, but I can only assume what happens is that the Corinthians read this and it's like, how can they argue? How can they argue with what Paul is telling them? Paul is telling them, this is what the Lord said. Clearly their practice in worship, it was not in line with what the Lord had said. They could continue to do what they had always done, but that wasn't going to be pleasing to God. They had to make corrections and worship how the Lord had instructed them to worship. So as we think about this topic of how we might react if we were, say, in one of these four situations, and think about that. Actually, let me go back. Think about that. Four different examples. One had their teaching corrected. One was corrected on a matter pertaining to salvation. One's correction had to do with what their conduct was. And then the last one, their worship was correct. Four different examples, and yet it deals with four different facets of things that we are told in Scripture. Not all of them had to do with the same type of thing. So let's put ourselves in that position as the one that's being correct. Let's think about typical reactions to correction. Specifically, I want to list some common reactions to correction, particularly the ones that get us in trouble. <laughs> not talking about the good reactions. Not I'm talking about the bad ones. So for example, I think many of us, when we're faced with the truth, sometimes we're quick to defend. I want you to understand, you may be thinking this morning, well, what if I'm not wrong? Like, what if a brother is trying to correct me and I'm actually right and they're wrong? That's not the circumstance I'm talking about this morning. That's a, that's a different discussion. What I'm specifically talking about this morning is when we're in a situation like those four examples where we are wrong where we are doing something that's contrary to what God would have us to do. Brother, when a faithful brother or when a faithful sister is seeking to correct us and they show us the Scriptures and we're not walking in line with that, I would tell us, let's not be so quick to have this reaction of defending ourselves. Let's not be so quick to jump to our defense or the defense of someone that we love that's doing wrong because what we might be doing is we might be defending error. And if we're quick to defend our faults, we're just probably going to continue on in sin and that's only going to hurt ourselves and maybe even others as well. Sometimes we just resist correction because we don't want to change. I don't like change. I'm not a big fan of change. Uh, and especially when you're talking about something like religious practices, typically we're talking about something that we've not just done for a short period of time. We've done it for a long period of time. Sometimes it's something that we've done our entire lives. Sometimes corrections might call for me to make a change. And even if it's the change that I know is needed according to the Scriptures, we dismiss it because we don't like the change or again, because we just we don't want to change. I would ask you this morning as we think about that potential reaction, do we really want to be guilty of not making corrections just because we don't like the changes that we know we'll have to make I would ask you, how are we going to explain that to God on the day of judgment? I don't know that that needs to be my reason. Sometimes we resist making corrections because we just don't want to admit that we're wrong. If I were to ask for a show of hands, I know I wouldn't get very many hands. Who likes being wrong? I don't like being wrong. I know you don't like being wrong either. Nobody does. I think what makes us some people different from other people is some people are it's easier for them to admit when they're wrong than for other people 
to admit when they're wrong. I think about specifically Apollos and, and Peter and putting myself in their position, especially someone that you know speaks publicly and things of that nature. Both of them were very prominent, you know, well-known figures within the church. Very well respected. Apollos was an eloquent speaker, it said. And often when you have people like that who have various degrees of followings, often what happens is it's very easy for them to let their egos get in the way of making the correction that they need to make. Brethren, even though it's hard, when we're wrong, we need to make corrections. We ought to humble ourselves and not be afraid to admit when we're wrong. I want you to think about this point. It is okay to mess up and then make corrections and ask for forgiveness. It is not okay to be stubborn and continue to do whatever it is that we're doing that's wrong. That, that, that's where we get ourselves into some big trouble. So at the beginning of our lesson, I said that I wanted us to think about this topic of correction from the perspective of us being that person that is being corrected. And we've seen different examples of people that were corrected uh, in the Scriptures. And we've talked about what our typical human reaction sometimes might be that keeps us from making the necessary corrections. But now I want us to put ourselves in three different scenarios. And I want us to think about how we might react. Because again, we're putting ourselves one so that we can think about making sure that we have the right reaction, but also understanding what it's like to be in that position so that when we try and make corrections in others, that we understand what it's like to be in their position. So what if I'm in a church that practices things differently than how the Bible teaches? And what if I'm corrected with the Scriptures and there is something about the way that I worship that is not scriptural, as was the case that we saw for the brethren in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11? Well, what does the Bible teach? John 4 and verses 23 through 24, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. So what if my worship, what if it has good intentions, but it's not according to the truth? Well, that's not the worship that it says that God desires according to what we just read. Well, what if my worship, what if it's something that it resembles New Testament worship, at least as far as the physical part of it, but my attitude is contrary to what God desires? For example, what if I attend a church that practices all the, quote, correct things, but maybe my mind isn't there. My heart isn't there. Maybe I'm distracted. Maybe my thoughts are distracting me. My phone distracts me. The side conversations I'm having, my heart is not, my attitude is not what it needs to be in worship. Whether it's the physical or whether it's the mental or the heart, if I'm not worshiping according to how God would have me to worship, that I'm not being pleasing to God. Not only that, but you think about Peter in Galatians. I may even be a bad example to others and lead others astray. What if I've been taught all my life that in order to be saved, fill in the blank, X must happen. Because there, I say X because there are so many different things that are taught out in the world. But what if I then realize that my brother comes to me and I realize that's not in line with what the Scriptures teach. And I say that because so many people are confronted, for example, with the topic of baptism and what the Bible actually says about baptism. And they hold on so tightly to whatever they were taught growing up, whatever their you know, denomination or their parents <laughs> taught them growing up. Well, I was baptized as an infant. Well, the preacher, he told me, if I'm just sprinkled with water, that that's okay. How dare you tell me that I'm not saved. That's some of the reactions you might get. Brother, when we're confronted with the truth of the Gospel of how people in the New Testament were saved, I would ask you, why do we hold on so tightly to something else? To error is what it is. If we want to be saved, there is no other option than to hold on tightly to the truth. You know, if we're not baptized into Christ for the remission of sins as the Bible teaches us in Acts 2, we ought to be like the Ephesians and make the corrections 
and obey what the Bible says. I would ask you, why cling to some false teaching if it cannot save you? I've never, I, I don't understand that. This last one's going to step on my toes a little bit, and then we'll get to our, our conclusion. I like, to, I like to preach it myself sometimes. What if the things that I've taught are not in line with the Scriptures? Even more of a, a subsection of that question. What if certain rules that I've bound on others are beyond the Scriptures, for example? Think about Apollos and his story. He was, again, a very well-respected teacher, but he was teaching something that was not the truth under the new covenant. Uh, in his case, what he was teaching, it was incomplete. He was ignorant concerning baptism into Christ. You know, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, he refers to this very important principle to not go beyond what is written. And you think about Paul's discussion leading up to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he mentioned a variety of problems that existed at that church at Corinth. And the problem was is that it was resulting in divisions. And the thing is, is that so often in the church, we can so easily cause problems and divisions by doing what? By going beyond what is written, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Often what we do is we exalt our human opinions to the level of Scripture. In some cases I've even seen it where we try and outdo one another to see you know, who is the most strict, who can connect themselves with whoever is perceived to be the most impressive as they did in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, it's my belief that as a church of Christ, our intention ought to be trying to do those that are things that are Scripture and all the things that we do, all the things that we teach, and all the things that we believe. But it's so easy for us to fall victim to things like going beyond the Scriptures. You know, it's so easy for us to have this mindset that this is the way that we have always done something. And then what we do is we take that attitude and we elevate it to the level of Scripture. And thus what we end up doing is we end up binding things that the Scriptures never taught. Similar mindset that I've heard often, and this is where I'm going to stomp on my own toes, is we'll elevate how we were raised or we elevate the things that we practiced growing up to the standard by which we judge others by whether it's scriptural or whether it's not. Frankly speaking, I can think of several examples of things that I was taught growing up, and they weren't necessarily bad rules. They weren't bad standards to follow, so I'm not faulting you know, my parents in that regard, but they also weren't something that the Bible taught, at least as far as the specifics were concerned. And that being the case, it would be wrong for me as a teacher to stand up here and teach you those things as if they were law. As a teacher, I'm warned in James chapter 3 to be careful about the things that I say. Thus, I need to be very careful not to go beyond what the Scriptures teach and bind things on others just because they were bound on me or something that I bind on myself. Examine yourself. And that really goes not just in that example, but anything that we teach that might be not according to the truth. If there's something right now that you are teaching that is not rooted in the truth, like Apollos, you need to be willing to make corrections. Don't be guilty of exalting your opinion to the level of Scriptures because that is exactly what causes problems in the church. The church at Corinth had a lot of problems and divisions. We don't want that to happen here at Ardmore. In conclusion this morning, making corrections is admittedly, it is not an easy thing to do. And I can tell you that because I, I don't, you know, I, making corrections is sometimes hard for me to do. It takes a humble spirit to admit when we're wrong. And we ought not let those things, those attitudes that we talked about, or, or perhaps like it was for Peter, the fear of what other people might think, we ought not let those get in the way of us doing what is right. Let's resist those typical human reactions to making corrections. And if we're in the wrong, let's be willing to make whatever change that we need to make to get ourselves in line with what God's Word teaches as we close here this morning, I want to bring up one more subject. And I would ask you, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I would tell you this morning, there is a glaring correction that you need to make. Because right now, I have to warn you that according to the Scriptures, unless you are willing to change your life and turn your life over to Christ, it's going to cost you your soul. 
But this morning, if you are willing to humble yourselves and submit yourself to the Lord, He has said that He will save you. You must put your trust in Him. You must repent of your sins. You must be willing to confess your faith in Him to others and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And only then can you be in a right relationship with Him. This morning, if there is someone that finds themselves subject to the Lord's invitation, come forward as we stand and as we sing.